war, nation building, greed, and a little bit of love. This is probably what best describes the books that I've recently just finished reading. And although these books weren't on my reading list for the year, I had to pick them up because they seemed really good and interesting to read at the time. And I have to say two of these books might be up there as with like the top five books of all time that I've ever read. So let's actually look at what books I've read. So the books are The Balkans, Nationalism, War and the Great Powers, uh, The Conditions of Love, Philosophy of Intimacy, Making the Modern Middle East, and Oil, Power and War, A Dark History. So the first book I read is The Balkans, Nationalism, War and the Great Powers. And there are a few ways to break down this book, but the way I've broken it down was Great Powers in the Balkans, um, Nationalism in the Balkans, uh, Outbreaks of Conflicts, and Ongoing Issues. The way the author talks about nationalism in the Balkans is actually related to the influence of the great powers. If you look at much of Balkan history, some great power was always involved with one Balkan nation or another. You have the Russian Empire, the British Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and the Ottoman Empire all influencing and shaping Balkan nations at some time in history. When you look at the history of the Balkans, what you'll find is that politicians were influenced by one of these great powers, one of these empires. Uh, Agrarian uh, uprisings were funded by one of these great powers. Um, even the shaping of the borders in the Balkans was influenced by one of these empires or great powers. It all relates back to the bigger countries that surrounded the Balkans. And the origins of nationalism in the Balkans, as with many other countries, for example in Africa, was a antidote or a unification against the influence of these great powers. In the early 18th century, there was a movement in Germany where basically intellectuals began to notice their lack of national thinking. A lot of philosophers and political writers were considering what it means to think about the nation. There's actually a very famous quote from one of the early German nationalists, Frederick Karl von Monser. I don't know if I said this right, but what he says is that the, compared to the British, uh, Swiss and the Dutch, that the Germans lack a national way of thinking. Now, when you compare this to the Balkan regions and their origins of nationalism, under the Ottoman Empire, a lot of the people inside the Balkans didn't have a national way of thinking uh, in the same way that the Germans did. And the author covers some of this. He then also covers that there were Balkan intellectuals who were living in Germany uh, around the time of the rise of nationalism and saw that nation building could be done around the, the idea of nationalism. And he actually gives a little bit of a uh, overview of some of the intellectuals who came from Germany back to the Balkans to talk about the need for a nation. And you'll see a bit of an evolution when it comes to people in the Balkans going from demanding equal rights under a constitution within the Ottoman Empire to outright self-determination, which is a radical shift. And as we said before, this was a response to the great powers roles in the Balkans. So let's look at what some of the great powers did in the Balkans. One starting example is in 1908, there was a annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina by Austria-Hungary. This, as a result, upset both Serbia and other Balkan nations because they weren't consulted, but it also upset Russia, which led to retaliations. You also have the Russo-Turkish Wars in 1878, which resulted in a, the Treaty of Berlin where several great powers came together and actually redrew the map of the Balkans because the reason why Russia went into the Balkans allegedly was to defend the uh, Christians in there who were being oppressed under Ottoman rule. And so this justified redrawing the maps because the demographics of people were shaped differently. And then in the Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913, you had a pretty complex uh, balancing of interest between great powers and it resulted in the Treaty of London, which was largely drafted by great powers. And the goal of it was to actually limit the foreign policy options of the Balkan nations to bring stability into Southern Europe. And then even to this day, you have what's called like the Southern Europe security policy by many of the nations in the European Union, uh, which again, aims to influence the Balkan nations. I think for example, Germany is investing a lot into Montenegro to this day. And another thing that the author is really great at doing is looking at the 
origins of these conflicts, what led to the outbreak of these conflicts. For instance, he explores the assassination of Ferdinand a little bit more in depth than what most people do and how this contributed to the outbreak of World War I. He also explores how the breakup of Yugoslavia led to ethnic tensions and he actually cites some pretty interesting literature written by Croats. And he also does a pretty good job of explaining the Balkan Wars with the Ottoman Empire or the Balkan League's wars against the Ottoman Empire and what were the origins of that conflict. And then finally, the book ends with covering some ongoing issues. The book was published by 2015, I think. So it's actually missed some issues, but overall it does cover a lot of the ongoing issues that are still persistent today. For example, there are still nationalist and ethnic tensions. Uh, Bosnia, Croats, and Serbs all still have issues. And Kosovo and Serbia also still have an issue ongoing about land and uh, how they treat their uh, citizens, or like expatriates, I guess you could say, like uh, ex-citizens that live in each other's countries. And actually, there is still religious tension that goes on in the Balkans as well, but it's a little bit less of an issue compared to the ethnic and nationalist tensions. And then if we're going to be completely transparent here, the great powers uh, have never actually stopped existing. We just call them the West and the East. And they still have a lot of influence and interest, vested interest, into the Balkans. Uh, China has made a lot of investments into infrastructure in places like Montenegro. And it's all part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Russia still wants to have a hegemonic influence over Serbia and to some extent Bulgaria. And uh, the West, uh, Western Europe still seeks uh, democratic and economic reforms in uh, the Balkans. Everyone still has vested interest. I would say since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, maybe the Turks have a little bit less uh, influence in the region. But for the most part, um, a lot of the great powers are still interested in this region. Now this next book, um, Conditions of Love, The Philosophy of Intimacy, I won't spend too much time talking about. I have made a more thorough video where I explore some of the ideas from this book. But I would say in general, this was a very fun book to read. It explores like what is a good conception of romantic love. And I think his conception of romantic love mm. is a little bit counterintuitive in some, in some senses. And so it's quite interesting. Uh, on top of that, um, what, what are the ways we can, in which we can define love? And he argues that some of the definitions of love are inadequate because we need to take like a Wittgensteinian like family resemblance approach to love and argues for a kind of family resemblance uh, notion of love, which I think is also quite interesting. And then he talks about um, like the over-romanticization of love in our modern culture and how that can be pretty detrimental to anything like mature or long-term or stable love. If you're looking for like a quick short read, I would recommend this book. If you're looking for like a good philosophy of love book, I would recommend this book. But if you have no interest in either one of those, then you could probably skip this book. I drink your milk. Now the next book is Oil, Power, and War, A Dark History. This, yeah, this is definitely the best book I've read all year. And it might even be one of the best books I've ever read in general. The problem is, is there's about five or six good, like really good books that I've read. But this book is super important. And I think anybody who wants to be educated on like modern affairs or even just the foreign policy of big nations, uh, you need to read this book. So the aim of the book is to actually look at the relationships between energy needs for big, big nations, uh, politics, and then conflicts. Uh, what are the three relations, like what are, what are the relationships between those three variables? And then and the secondary argument of this book or like premise of this book is that it reveals the importance of oil in uh, foreign policy or the interests of nations. For oil and gas, need oil and gas. American oil. Of crude oil. New oil exploration. He has a great starting point. He, for example, argues that the only reason Japan went to war was because of oil. He quotes a general who took over the Jap Japanese empire. And the quote is something to the effect of, I will not let my nation become a third class nation. Here's another quote that I'm gonna read at length. If we forbid oil shipments to Japan, Japan will increase her purchases of Mexican oil. And furthermore, may be driven by actual necessity to a descent on the Dutch East Indies. At this writing, we will regard such an action on our part as encouragement to the spread of war in the Far East. This is Eleanor Roosevelt. And then here's another quote from an American uh, think tank. Japan's natural resources would be markedly diminished 
the shortage of liquid fuels in particular would be would deal a fatal blow to the nation. This was in the context of Anglo-Saxon sanctions onto Japan. And uh, General uh, Hidoki, I think his name was, I can't remember his name. He made that quote about his not letting his nation be a third class nation after, after authorizing the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was right after he authorized the attack on Pearl Harbor, that quote he, uh, he made. And another famous example is uh, the Blitzkrieg, uh, Germany. Germany's Blitzkrieg, when it went to war, uh, it did Blitzkrieg because it didn't have oil. Um, at the time, war machines were beginning to burn oil. I think America had some oil warships that were pretty impressive. And Japan had a few, but Japan had no oil, which is why they went to Manchuria. They were drilling for oil, but uh, by the time that they got there, it, uh, they basically lost it. And then when China found the oil in Manchuria, Mao actually said that this is enough oil to provide them for all their development needs. So there was oil in Manchuria, and Japan wasn't wrong about that. But Germany was uh, going to work because it wanted oil. And it was burning, I think, it got concessions from Russia. It was burning about 150,000 barrels per day at the uh, peak of its army. And it wanted the oil fields in Baku. Uh, I believe it wanted the oil fields in Romania and it did seize the oil fields in Romania. They were sabotaged at one point, but then they were fixed and eventually they were able to use. And it wanted the oil fields in the rest of the Middle East as well, which is, unfortunately that didn't happen. So <laughs> yeah, so Germany was basically searching for oil. They were burning 150,000 barrels per day and they were only producing 9,500 barrels per day. My fellow citizens. And then another war that was about oil is the Iran-Iraq war. And how do we know this? Well, we don't absolutely know this, of course, but we can infer. And one of the things that can make us infer towards this conclusion was a quote from Henry Kissinger, among the many that are cited in the book, surprisingly. One of them is that we have a, it's in response to the Arab Springs and it's to the effect of we have to stop a regional hegemony from arising such that we can ensure the free flow of energy. This is an actual quote in 2012 from Henry Kissinger in response to the Arab Springs. Now what the author does is contrast that to another quote, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, in the early, like in the, during the time of the Iran-Iraq war, Kissinger can be quoted as saying we should be funding both sides. Now, if you take the 2012 quote and give it to the earlier quote, it seems like this is kind of revealing of the inference that Kissinger just wanted, and even back in the 80s, both of the powers to basically squish each other so that no oil could be brought to the market and that America could control the market. And on top of that, when you look at things like Operation Ajax, which is now publicly known, uh, which is an attempt for, <laughs> to, to coup Iran, or if we see Eleanor Roosevelt's grandson uh, actually engaging in a coup in Iran, Right? Even though there was a, a point where Eleanor wrote to him, and the author quotes the, uh, the letter, to not do it, basically to calm down. He, he did it anyways. I think it's safe to say that the, both the Iraq War and the Iran-Iraq War were wars for oil. Another thing the book talks about, which I thought was really interesting, was the absolutely horrendous business practices engaged in in the early oil industry, especially by the Rockefellers. Uh, John D. Rockefeller in particular. Uh, not only did we have this issue of the railway stations offering a lower price towards John D. Rockefeller for shipping his oil, but also increasing the price to his competitors, even though John D. Rockefeller had lower quality oil, which then in turn resulted in him buying up all of his competitors because he had uh, excess cash flow. You also had the issue of Rockefeller um, basically because he had so much money, he want, he would, for example, want to buy, like, say, stock at a grocery store. Right? He wanted to buy stocks to a grocery store. He would ask for, in specific, a 5% discount on the stock purchases, or they said they would open up grocery stores and operate them at a loss, right, just to put them out of business. And the only reason he could do this was because of the original monopoly he gained as a result of the bad business practices of the railway stations. And then you have, of course, bribing public officials. Uh, the famous case example that the author cites was the bribing of public officials to buy gas lights rather than electric lights. And then General Sherman uh, created the Sherman Act, which was meant to break up uh, standard oil, but Sherman was bribed to not actually enforce the Sherman Act. It was never used. Even though it was designed to break up companies like Standard Oil, it was never used because General Sherman was basically uh, being paid. Now, the last idea that the book explores that I think is worth mentioning here is the concept of peak oil. And the concept of peak oil is that oil peaked in 1973 
uh, some people debate about the date, but uh, the author argues 1973, and since then the oil reserves have been going uh, consistently down. One great example is uh, most of the oil extraction that we now do has to go to more difficult spots in order to get oil. Uh, the talks about how we've, um, oil derricks are going more and more off of the coasts of uh, nations, and they're going further and further into the water, and they have to go deeper and deeper down. And there is a famous uh, oil rig, I think, in the Indian Ocean. I don't remember which ocean it's in, but basically it cost them like $800 billion just to get to the point of like 2,000 barrels a day. Something like that is way too investment intensive, which means cheap oil will also disappear. It's not that just oil is declining, cheap oil will also disappear. And he talks about that this could have some pretty serious consequences since there isn't a lot of energy replacements for oil just yet. Uh, you would, he said you would need 200 times the amount of hydro, 25 times the amount of nuclear, and something like 67 times the amount of uh, wind and geothermal, which we don't have right now. So we, st we still do need oil, but the problem is it's going to be expensive oil. And the last time oil got too expensive, he actually interestingly shows, and he, he's right when he says this, isn't, and it's a response to the 2008 financial crisis. We don't talk about this a lot, but the price of oil jumped up to $145 per barrel in 2008. And you, the, some of the banks that went under were started by Standard Oil. Uh, Chase was a oil bank, and I believe the Lehman Brothers also had a lot of money tied into oil as well. And he also, the, he also talks about a study where they looked at like 600 or 700 wells in the world and wanted to actually see, okay, is the oil in decline? Or is it just that extraction is getting more expensive? What's actually going on here, right? And this is some of the bullet points he took from the study that I think are actually really, really great. So the first bullet point is at least 64% of the world oil is in decline, world oil production is in decline. By 2040, there will be a need to develop more than 40 million barrels per day of new resources, nearly half of the world's production, or equivalent of four Saudi Arabias, to maintain the current, maintain the current production levels. Small petroleum fields begin to decline generally two times faster than large fields, where world production of crude depends more and more on the small fields. Uh, the significant improvements in production and drilling efficiency undertaken in response to price drops have masked the underlying rate of decline, but the degree to which the improvements continue is limited. And then he also talks about the oil fields of all these big oil nations. So Russia's oil fields are in decline, Venezuela's uh, it declined already in like I think the 90s. Uh, America's oil fields declined like in the the 80s or the 90s. Like they basically are just going down continuously in terms of oil uh, oil left in the actual fields. Uh, yeah, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iraqs, all these big oil countries, all the most of their oil fields, over 50% of their oil fields, are in decline. Which means, uh, and this is I think the best conclusion of this book, if we look at what happened in World War One and World War Two in the early 2000s. These arguably, maybe you disagree, were all about oil. All these wars were about oil. You might disagree, but you can't at least deny that oil was a big factor in a lot of the decisions that these nations made. And there's quotes of leaders maybe testifying to that fact, right? This means that if oil is truly in decline, there's going to be a scramble for a new energy source. And that's probably going to be uranium at this point, which this author could have predicted easily, you now see France is in trouble in Africa and the country that no longer wants French troops there and wants to basically take over the uranium mines that France is operating is Niger, right? Uh, and other countries want to kick France out as well. And I think France gets 20% of its uranium from Niger. So there's going to be a new scramble for energy sources that could lead to more conflicts. And I think, yeah, what currently happened is a great testament to that. Now this last book, Making the Modern Middle East, is a book that tells Middle Eastern history through the nationalist leaders that have arisen and the relationships those leaders had to the great powers. So he does like the usual thing where he talks about how the vacuum of the Ottoman Empire, basically during the fall of the Ottoman Empire, led to various ethnic groups in the Ottoman Empire wanting to seek independence, right? Because the Ottoman Empire was a pretty diverse group of people. And when the Ottoman Empire fell, a lot of these people decided to seek their own independence or create their own nations. You had Faisal Emir, who was the leader of the Arab Kingdom. You had Ibn Saud, who created the Saudi states. You had King Hussein, who was king of Hejaz. And then you had the Whites, White, Whitesmen and the other Zionists, uh, who also wanted to form a nation. So yeah, you had a lot of different groups of people trying to seek out 
nations in former Ottoman regions. Now going back to like 1860, you can find this guy Ibrahim al Yazidi. I don't know if it's correctly pronounced, but he writes this, uh, like you could say manifesto or like ideas about Arab nationalism or like an Arab nation in Syria in like 1860. Nothing comes of it. And then in 1912, when the constitutional reforms occurred in the Ottoman Empire, you had a nationalist movement in Syria, a movement that saw independence. Around the same time, you have this guy named Herbert Samuel, basically bartering with the British to cut up a piece of former Ottoman territory, namely Palestine, to guarantee the home for Zionism. And he went so far as to actually offer the British to protect the Suez Canal if they guarantee them Palestine. And of course, as all of these nationalists were seeking independence, the Ottomans did just sit around and take it. Uh, what you had was Mustafa Kemal, right? Ataturk came to power and Ataturk got rid of a lot of the great powers that were influencing the country and uh, basically retained some of, some of the former Ottoman territory, but not all of it, and protected like kind of like the core, what, you would have to, what is today modern Turkey. So what's kind of interesting about this as well is even in this book you see um, comparing this to like the, uh, the Balkan history book, you see the spread of nationalism coming from uh, like the British across Europe to Germany, then from Germany to the Balkans. But I think when it hit the Balkans, it was around the same time as it hit the uh, Middle East and uh, uh, Asia Minor, I guess Turkey, or Ottoman Empire. It was kind of around the same time. So there's a bit of a spread there, right? It's like a kind of like a contagion. I will say that what this book does great at highlighting, it's like it highlights just how terrible the British managed their, their influence. Because at the time, the French had no influence in Syria, really. They couldn't afford to like have the same military uh, dominance in Syria as the British could. The British did have a lot of influence in the Balkans as well. And they did have T.E. Lawrence, who was working with, uh, I think it was Faisal, um, who was doing a good job of harassing the Ottomans. And the British were kind of dominant in the, in the region, but they messed it up. Like they lost everything. I, I, I think this is a, a testament to when when the nationalist movements began to arise, you could no longer do this thing where you dominate groups of people. And the British didn't realize that. And if you look at like American foreign policy, I feel like the biggest difference is between like uh, France, uh, Britain, Russia, and then America is that these three kind of try and dominate the local people, whereas the Americans use puppet governments, right? They use puppets and as a result, it's much harder to see the kind of oppression that's coming from a foreign power. And that's why I think America's had so much more success uh, than the British have. And that's probably why the British declined so rapidly in their foreign policy. But with that being said, those are the last books I read. I was supposed to be reading finance books. I'll try and get to some of those. But I just love history at the, at the, at the moment. And I have so many books, you know, if I could just go and look and like, oh, that seems interesting, I'll just read it. But um, the next book I think I'm supposed to read is The Righteous Mind. I think I started chapter one and I didn't get through it. I want to review it for you guys. A lot of you guys want to hear my take on that. And if you have anything to say about these books, let me know. If you had to read one of these books, please read The Oil, Power and More book. That it, book is mind blowing. Um, this is a super important book. I think if I ever made a list of like books you should absolutely read, that would be like maybe number one on that book. Uh, but with that being said, guys, Bye-bye.